just one moment to uh, in, reintroduce uh, Dylan Reed from Advanced Energy Economy. Had to get a Pennsylvanian up here to introduce the Pennsylvania congressman here. So uh, I have obviously the distinct honor of uh, introducing Congressman Ryan Costello, uh, who is uh, from southeastern Pennsylvania. And as I just mentioned, as a Pennsylvania native, I'm very uh, excited to do this, but also believe that Pennsylvania represents really a great example of the energy innovation that's going on today, not only in 2017, but really across decades of what's been going on there. It just from this summer, if you look at the energy mix in Pennsylvania, it's incredibly diverse, pulling 40% from nuclear, like it's second in the United States in that, 29% from natural gas, which is fueled from the uh, fracking revolution where I came from in the uh, Marcellus Shale region. Um, but that says nothing about the, the growth that we've seen in solar and wind and energy efficiency jobs, where it's totaling almost 70,000 jobs between uh, over 4,600 solar jobs, uh, almost 2,500 wind jobs, and then over 62,000 in energy efficiency. Uh, so you can see how uh, these diverse energy mixes really being supported by uh, uh, strong policies in Pennsylvania, uh, which the congressman worked on uh, uh, when he was a county commissioner. Uh, and Ada Lee has strongly believed since he came to Congress uh, that he represents an, a leader on advanced energy policy uh, from our conversations with him and, and his interaction with, with businesses and our network. Uh, we certainly understand that from his work at the local level as a county commissioner that he understands the power of energy uh, and what that means for local economies. Uh, and that bad policy at the end of the day can be bad for the market, businesses, and consumers. Uh, so, so we certainly know from our conversations that, that uh, Congressman Costello understands the importance of good policy and, and for advanced energy. And you can see that here in DC uh, as he's you know, a member of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee and has been leading on, on issues such as uh, the, the Gibson Resolution uh, on greenhouse gas emissions and, and many other policies. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce Congressman Costello. Thank you. Nice to be with you all. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you for a couple minutes. I will keep my uh, comments somewhat general in nature and offer them through the perspective of a Republican member of Congress uh, in a district that has always had a particular environmental sensitivity uh, to policymaking uh, to highlight what the importance of this issue is and why we're focused on it, um, at least why I'm focused on it, myself and others. And I would just ask um, at the conclusion of my comments, if you have some thoughts or suggestions on how I can better frame or uh, provide context or describe um, where we're hopefully headed um, in the clean energy field, please share that with my uh, my office staff. My staff spends a lot of time on this issue uh, because we think that there's a lot to be said about it um, from an environmental protection, a public health, and an economic development perspective. I really do think that those issues merge together um, when you talk about clean energy and reducing carbon emissions uh, and what the, the, the long-term policy objective is. It really does touch upon a number of different areas, and I also think uh, that it really hits at the values that a lot of constituents have, um, but maybe don't fully appreciate uh, relative to how this issue um, embodies those values. Um, and so as I, as, I, as I move into my prepared remarks, um, I think that generating new American technology, uh, creating more jobs and growing our economy through providing more affordable energy choices is the framework, is the economic framework through which we approach the clean energy issue from a policy perspective. Um, energy independence, obviously, I think um, is, is how you would present this vis-a-vis um, -vis other energy sources that aren't carbon free um, from a national security perspective. But uh, from a policy perspective, if we are seeking to innovate first and to provide accessible, available, and affordable clean energy through um, providing more energy choices, that is a much preferred policy approach 
than regulating first your particular energy choices. There is a tendency, there are unintended consequences, uh, there are market distortions, and oftentimes the innovation that's out there actually will accelerate beyond what the regulatory framework is in the first instance that might be set up. Um, I can tell you that in southeastern Pennsylvania, the RFS uh, and what that, how that hits southeastern Pennsylvania a little bit differently uh, than other areas leads to market distortions and creates some complications. Whereas if we're just trying to clear the field and allow innovation to lead, I think we're in a much better position moving forward 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now so that um, we have abundant energy sources, most or all of which are carbon free or are able to become carbon free through carbon capture technology. Um, looking just at regulation as the mechanism through which we get to um, a, a clean energy future, I think is we're going to find ourselves um, needing more than that, which is why I focus first on innovation. I also think from an economic development perspective, uh, when you look at where the venture capital dollars go and you look at how much of a competitive advantage we have relative to the rest of the world in the field of innovation, right? This could be medical technology, it could be clean energy technology. The more that we are incentivizing capital in this space, uh, the better off that we will be. And focusing on the technology and the investment in technology and R&D versus um, making sure we have the right bureaucracy to uh, interpret and enforce a very complicated regulatory framework, I think the uh, former is much preferred to the latter. And um, as an example, uh, I just read this morning, I think I have it with me, I do. Uh, XTO Energy, subsidiary of ExxonMobil, um, largest nat nat natural gas producer in the United States, today announced a set of commitments to reduce methane emissions from its production and midstream operations nationwide. Uh, innovation is already headed in the right direction, I think, and particularly on the, on the issue of methane, um, it, it's very thankful that we do have uh, our companies focused on that, because that's been a point of contention, I think, if you look at uh, congressional votes over the past year or two. Um, uh, and, and the more that we have companies out there in front just doing what needs to be done and not relying on a regulatory compliance that they need to um, meet, but rather it's the right thing to do, that's really the way, I think, that we move forward on it. Uh, the other thing, um, if I could step back for a second, because I often get asked, we have the Climate Solutions Caucus, which continues to grow. Carlos Corbello is a good friend of mine. Ted Deutsch is the Democrat. Um, this um, bipartisan caucus has grown to, I think, over 50 members at this point. But let's be honest, the question I get asked is, that's great that you um, have the, the Gibson resolution, which is, you know, in this iteration of Congress, um, a different member of Congress's name. But the point is, you have more Republicans gravitating to, uh, to the belief that uh, reducing carbon emissions is something that we need to do. And you have um, more members of Congress realizing that this is an issue that they need to pay attention to. But until you deal in the policymaking space on this, all we're really doing is just talking. And so what do you do from a policymaking perspective? There are some uh, larger, uh, more far-reaching policy objectives as it relates to uh, looking at what the, the Paris benchmarks were going to be and if the United States does pull out of that legislatively what we should be out there um, advocating for as a replacement. Um, but in the short term, how do you hit singles? Uh, and I think the biggest area, if you look at appliance and equipment efficiency standards, much of which has come out in the past several years, there has been some attempt to roll uh, back in that space. Um, this is a situation, we're talking about 60 different categories of appliances and equipment in both the residential and commercial sectors. Um, and these energy efficiency standards, I think, are very important. They're not that costly, and uh, corporate America has already sort of um, baked that into the cake. And so I think that's an area where we should be playing defense and we should make sure that we are setting the kind of uh, standards in energy efficiency that are lasting, uh, that are achievable, um, and that uh, go about accomplishing the objective of requiring less energy to use that equipment. Uh, and I think, uh, furthermore, 
that that's an area where we can just we can educate the public as to how just smartly using your um, your con your goods your products um, goes the way of reducing carbon emissions. Another point related to that: uh, the House passed driverless car technology. Um, you know the, the the role of sensors and our ability um, to use them to reduce energy. Um, the, the, the battery storage issue and where we're headed from just being able to preserve our energy for longer periods of time. Uh, but on the driverless technology and the, the element of reducing congestion mitigation, uh, it is estimated that by 2040, 33 percent of all cars uh, will be electronic vehicle driverless technology. It's also estimated that half the cars on the roadway uh, will be so. So there, there is a tremendous opportunity just through innovation and just through consumer behavior to go about reducing carbon emissions, which I think is exciting. And that's another reason why I don't think the, the regulate first approach um, is the right way to do this. I think the innovate first approach and making sure that the regulatory barriers don't prevent innovation um, is the right approach. And you'll be hearing more about that from myself and other members of Congress uh, in the weeks and months and years to come. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, workforce development issues. Um, you see a tremendous amount of capital investment in wind and solar uh, in the United States of America. Uh, and yet, uh, a lot of times when you talk about the jobs that are created, most people don't realize that it's on the installation side, not on the manufacturing side, but on the installation side of a lot of that equipment, which is where a lot of the jobs are in this country, um, will be in the clean energy sector. Uh, and if you look, uh, whether it's advanced manufacturing or in the building trades, we do have a skills gap in this country. And so taking the Perkins Act and some of the other workforce development dollars and making sure that we are educating those uh, in, in, even in middle school, creating career awareness, but in high school, so that they have the kind of skills that translate within the clean energy sector for years to come, just to make sure that those jobs stay here. I think the more that the jobs stay here, the more you have an investment by constituents across this country to believe in the importance of clean energy, leaving aside what it does from an environmental perspective, but just from an economic development perspective. Um, finally, I just want to thank all of you. Um, for your advocacy, for your policy proposals, and for making this an issue um, which is here and now, but which is critically important to the future of our country. I visited Miami last year. Uh, they're not debating whether or not the sea level is rising and what caused it, although we know why the acidification uh, due to carbon. Um, they are preparing their infrastructure to deal with the fact that the sea level is, drive, is, is increasing. And they're dealing with the budget constraints of figuring out a way to adapt to that. Um, which is to say that climate change is not a theoretical issue. All of you know that. But when our municipal governments around this country are having to prepare with the impact, it becomes very important for us to double down on our focus um, and work on these issues. And we, as members of Congress, rely on those uh, who advocate and who propose policies to educate and inform the public as well as us. There are a million and one things that members of Congress deal with on a daily basis. And just trying to get members to focus on a certain set of issues sometimes can be challenging. I think all of you do an exceptional job at that. And I would just encourage you uh, to continue doing that. Uh, one final point. I don't know if anybody saw the Eagles game over the weekend. Did anybody see the Eagles game? 61-yard field goal. Some of you may think that the reason I'm wearing this green tie is because of the Eagles, but it's not. It's the green jobs that we will have in this country for decades to come due to all of your leadership. Thank you very much.